Toys is a typical example of a sector that is largely driven by producing big amounts of low price items with low engagement. As a result, kids, you know, I don't have kids myself, but I've seen my nephew, my niece, and my friend's kids, they have like 20,000 toys each, right? And these are very likely to be produced overseas, shipped over to here. And then once they are no longer interesting or relevant, what happens? I wish I'd listened to my gut. I think it's virtually impossible. Like if you look at the experience that you go through in the growth of a venture from, you know, your ideas into a garage, from, you know, how do you turn that into a products and more products and how do you grow that into successful business and, and, and failing business? How do you engage with 52 shareholders? How do you buy out some share, some investors? How do you take over a business? How do you sell a business? Yeah, you may study, you may read books, but lately if, you know, once you go through this experience, that's when you learn. On today's episode, managing partner of Spin Ventures and circular economy advocate, Nick Garini. Nick, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi. How are you? Good. Very good. So for the audience to understand, you're a managing partner at Spin Ventures, which is an ecosystem on a mission to accelerate the transition to circular economy in the consumer space. So yeah. tell us, what is circular economy? Uh, thank you, Dana. So I guess there are a variety of definitions of circular economy. I guess the way we're looking at circularity is, I would say, inspired by nature, where everything in nature kind of like is to perfect use, so nothing gets wasted. And uh, if you look at, you know, resources in nature, every single you know, material that exists, every single process that exists, everything creates value. And and so I guess we sort of like try to replicate that through innovative technologies, uh, through new materials, through new design, new manufacturing methods, new business models in fast growing consumer business. So you could, for example, imagine a pair of jeans, right? So if I am you know, a jeans brand and I sell jeans, then I want to make sure that I use the material and then I design jeans so they can be used and then perhaps reused. And then I also want to enable, uh, you know, Johnny here to, you know, purchase a pair of jeans uh, or maybe rent a pair of jeans uh, or and when Johnny doesn't want their jeans anymore, perhaps bring it back to me so I can rent it to someone else or I can sell it to someone else. Mm. And when their jeans is no longer good to for use because maybe they've had it for like three, four years, then, you know, we can make something else with that jeans, which is maybe a chair or a carpet or something else until at the end the material is fully used. So that's kind of like, so the concept of circular economy is, again, is to make sure that material resources are uh, used for the best of their uh, potential value throughout a series of um, innovation throughout the supply and value chain. And there's a lot of technologies and operational model. Okay, like I have that. so many questions at the back of this already. <laughs> so so are all these uh, companies like Vestier and, and Spock and, and all the other ones that uh, sell used uh, fashion brands, are they a part of the circular economy? Does that count? Or they have to be 100% 360 degree integrating this model of circularity in their business model to be counting as a part of that? I think there's no right or wrong definition of uh, circularity or circular economy. By all means, uh, the concept of circular economy comes from um, an architect in, back in the 80s. So it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like a, an old concept that's been developed to drive operational efficiencies in the use of materials. Hey guys, I have a very exciting announcement to make. I'm partnering up with my very first sponsor, which is none other than Momo Kombucha, our own London-based, locally produced, healthy and delicious kombucha, which I've been a fan of since the first time I tried it. Now, for the ones of you that know me, you know that I'm obsessed with my health, but at the same time, I'm a devout foodie, so nothing will keep me away from the tasty foods and drinks. Now, unfortunately for me, most delicious drinks are full of sugars and healthy additives. So this is why I love Momo so much. It is healthy because it's full of probiotics that are healthy for my gut, but at the same time, it's delicious, so it curbs my cravings. If you want to try Momo for yourself, use a discount code, isthisit15, 
to get a 15% discount on your first order. And then um, specifically to your question, there are amazing business out there that are doing little bit of the puzzle, right? So for example, you know, there's an amazing mending platform created by these young, fantastic entrepreneurs called Janine Phillips. And um, for example, she has made repairing, a, you know, like a pair of denim, a t-shirt, a, a dress, uh, 2025 proof, right? So so, um, so there's, a, there's an app that will allow you to mend and repair I need products. It. Yes. Right now. Dojo. So this is, so for example, these are, you know, so they're doing one bit of the puzzle. There are other amazing platforms. You know, there's a, there's a girl called Laura. She's developed this platform called Kids O'Clock, for example. And she, um, she helps, you know, like mom and kids to make the most of their clothes. So they, um, it collects clothes. So let's say kids, you know, no longer needs or use for a certain uh, product. So she makes sure that these products get collected, incentivize stores to do collections, and then provides these people with incentive to purchase other. Again, there are other, you, you, you were asking specifically about a couple of companies. Yes, yeah, so there's a Vestier, there's Spock, uh, I think there's Vinted. All of these are platforms and websites that allow you to sell used goods. Yes, yes. So there, uh, there are. So Vistia Collective is one they started quite um, early. They're now most recently. I, I remember I read they've just secured a partnership with the Caring Group with Gucci. So they, you know, they kind of like optimize the process of selling secondhand clothes. Mm. I mean, this is nothing new, right? I mean, we, they take we, a big margin though, like twenty five percent or something. Yeah, but I think now they've done a partnership with Gucci, and again. They just uh, are implementing a piece of the puzzle. And uh, so we see a variety of these players. And I guess, uh, you know, someone might say that, you know, you may design products differently so they can be reused. Someone, you know, there's a company who embed little chips in the denim mm -hmm. or in any products, if you wish, so that you can track and trace. So, for example, let's say I've purchased this pair of denim jeans and I pay them, I don't know, 100 pounds. And then uh, tomorrow, maybe I no longer want them for any reason, right? Maybe I need to leave. Maybe I don't like the color anymore. Uh, maybe I did get a little bit fatter. I don't know. So <laughs> In one day, bam, that was a great meal. <laughs> and um, so imagine, you know, imagine I had on my phone an app that simply by touching my, my denim, just not even scanning, just with the, with the um, RFID tag, to tell me, oh, okay, Nick, so now your denim are now worth £62.46. So if you press here, we can, you know, we can collect them for you or you can bring them to the closest store or, hey, actually, if you want to purchase another pair of denim, here's your £50 vouchers. So there are a variety of these, like, new innovations out there, thousands of uh, these little players out there. And I guess we try to, what we do is we, we invest in them, we bring them together so we can then go to the large corporations, you know, like, like again, in the, in the clothing and apparel sectors, in the automotive sectors, in the real estate sectors, in any sectors and say, okay, if you guys are planning to do denim, then these are a series of, you know, innovators that can help you and make a denim circular. I understand. So... You kind of work with the small spearheading innovators, idea makers that are they're flexible. They're they're bringing new fresh ideas to the table, mm -hmm. and then you help them obviously by connecting them to bigger uh, companies. But then you are you are bringing the circularity to the masses by actually approaching the big companies, which have the numbers and the quantities to impact the the actual market share. Correct, absolutely. Yeah, that is it's. I would say we are quite as as a as a group as a business. We're not your traditional accelerator. We're not your traditional invest investment firm. We're not your traditional sort of like innovation or consulting company. You know, we we are a group with all these different arms. So there's a, an accelerator. There's an investment unit turning into a VC fund. And there's like a corporate engagement unit, uh, which is sort of, you know, work with corporations, both at 
strategic level, speaking with the boards, but also at operational level, speaking with you know managers who need to implement. The reason why we had to create this uh, you know sort of like quite complex system is to make sure that things happen lately. So if you think about it, uh, you know startups. Startups want to receive funding for growth and they want to receive customers so they can grow. So we make sure that there's an environment where that happens. Investors, clearly, they want to invest in innovators that they are in line with, but also they want to make sure their risk of investments are mitigated, right? Mm -hmm. These are early stage investments, so these are high risk um, investment. And so by bringing together a group of innovators, we offer to corporations and to end solutions so you have you know you don't need to go and speak with 120 people you have all of them in a place so you know you can implement circularity as a corporation so corporations are happy because they can they can make trials they can make pilots they can explore opportunities in a sort of like safer environment yeah. so it works for corporation because they mitigate the risk of innovation so how exactly does that happen? Because I understand you are the hub, so you bring those idea creators together, these yeah. new entrepreneurs. Yeah. But how is the risk mitigated exactly? So for... By you vetting those entrepreneurs? Um, that is that is a part of the process, but I guess there's different type of risk. But let's say, let's stick if if we like with the with the genes examples um, or any other example. Well, let's take Danim. So let's say that you are a large player in the denim industry, right? You are one of those amazing brands like Levi's or, you know, Diesel or you name it. So you, you're you selling millions, if not billions of pair of jeans um, every day. And of course, now, you know, now what's happening, the regulatory environment has changed. So now you need to, it's becoming a, a mandatory requirement that you need to assess your environmental impact. You need to make that transparent to consumer. You need to transparent. You, you need to make that transparent to the public. And when you present your in the future, when you present your financial outputs, you also need to present your environmental, social, and governance output. Right. Mm. So this is no longer an option. This has become something corporations bigger than a certain size have to do now. So that is the very basic. So now. Imagine a manager goes like, oh my God, I need to do this. What do I do? And uh, research shows that the know-how in the sector is very limited. Mm. Uh, by very limited, I mean 5 to 7%. Okay, this is a new sector, you know. As it's 5 to 7% of people that know what to do yes. to move towards so, okay. Yes, uh, correct. Thank you. So uh, there's different research uh, that shows there's one that I will usually refer to done by the New York University. And they ask, I think it was 1,200 board members of uh, 5,500 who had publicly pledged to net zero goals. And they've asked them, okay. How? So, yeah, how are you going to make this happen, right? And 0.2% uh, said, I have, you know, I've already done similar project. So that's 20 people, right? 25 people. 6.8% confirm they had some previous experience, right? And so this 7% kind of like know what they're going to do pretty much or who to go to. But the remainder 92%, you know, they're just going into the unknown. So for them, it's it's new, you know, and it's not, I mean, there's, by all means, there's no, we're not talking about uh, these good or bad people, you know, there's, there's nothing like moral judgment. It's just like by experience, this is, genuinely new okay and so there are a lot of managers that need to face this new imperative and we are talking about an economic imperative we're not just talking an environmental imperative okay so in our interpretation uh, of circular economy it is a system that drives operational efficiencies right so it works better because you keep track of your materials and your products it also needs to drive incremental revenues because mm. if I'm selling the same products two, three, four times, clearly I'm maximizing my revenues opportunity. And so lately it needs to drive higher EBITDA margin contribution. Okay. So we are in the economy sphere. So so how, how I find that that's probably the challenging part, right? Well, if you are, first of all, uh, this is our sort of like perspective. We, you know, we are always trying to bring together the environmental impact 
with the economic and financial impact. Okay, for us, the two needs to be aligned. One fits the other. And then if we bring this conversation into a corporation, clearly, you know, a manager or more managers that have, you know, that for many years have been operating under certain standards. And, you know, imagine all of a sudden we arrive and we say, hey, guys, we have this company creating this new biodenim made with hemp. And then there's this other company who's going to put a chip in every product you sell. And then there's this other company who's going to help, you know, Donna to mend her jeans when they're, you know, when, you know, there was a... When they're not thing. ripped on purpose. Or, yeah, <laughs> or um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of changes. And uh, for a corporation to sort of like to the, I guess the term would be to operationalize change, it's always difficult, you know, whether it's, you know, imagine... 25, 30 years ago, when all of a sudden, here's the internet, you know, it, it was new, you know, people, people didn't know how to make the internet happen, you know, whether you sell denim or furniture or financial services, comes the internet, how, how do you, how do you use it, right? And it's a similar, I guess, um, it's a similar curve here where there's something new, uh, clearly it represents an opportunity Every opportunity of change clearly represents a risk, risk of failure, risk of, you know, change. Oh my God, is this, is this new material going to be uh, resistible? Is it going to create any allergy? Is it going to create this? You know, what? So there are always areas of risk. So I guess by working with these ventures, by working with them, getting to know them, bringing them together, we, yes, we sort of like minimize the risk of innovation. Mm, because essentially these corporations come to you as experts in the field. So them mitigating the risk is basically leveraging your knowledge and expertise in the field. That would be in the best case scenario. Yes, I guess um, we are. First of all, we've surrounded ourselves with uh, people with great experience in those sectors. Um, and that is key. So first of all, we surrounded ourselves with individual who have worked in some of these amazing corporations at the highest level. That is important because once you sit with the corporations, again, whether in the clothing and apparel industry, in the automotive industry, in the public sectors, first and foremost, it's important that you understand their challenges, right? So you need to understand their challenge, the, their imperatives, their, their priorities. Once you understand that, then you can start thinking, okay, so how could we, with a, you know, with a group of you know, talented entrepreneurs and innovators, how could we help them to achieve their environmental and economic goals mm. through innovations? And, and that is, it's more of a relationship that, that starts. Uh, you know, they, they do want to, they want to get to know us. They want to get to know these ventures. And then very slowly, very slowly, eventually you will get to maybe a little trial, maybe a little project. And that project maybe becomes a pilot, and then maybe the pilot is a failure. So, <laughs> so you want to repeat the pilot, and then you learn, and then the pilot is successful, and then you launch it, and then you repeat. That's the type of relationship with large corporates, yes. Mm, I see. So, well, it sounds amazing. And I must say, also for the audience, I did not know or had not come across the term of a circular economy before I came across uh, your name. So I'm literally here learning, and this this episode is very much propelled uh, from curiosity as well as, of course, common vision of, you know, making our planet cleaner and 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 better <laughs> for all of us. Um. So, what are the the obstacles that this model is facing? The biggest obstacles you see? I guess I would say there there are a variety of obstacles. I think what we experience as a biggest ob obstacle is. Uh, there's a lot of confusion out there. There's a lot of pressure these days. Um, I mean, there's external pressure from the environment because clearly climate has become, um, I think someone said, uh, at human extinction level. So the problem is there, you know, so that's a problem. There's a, the second is clearly this has created so like one of the, I think it's the first time that we talk about climate anxiety. Mm. Um, you know, so there's been a lot of activism around climate. It this this activism has created uh, this climate anxiety, but all of this sense of you know 
urgency and fears clearly drives uh, the good, I would say the good thing is this has sort of like forced leaders, policymakers in sort of like creating new, a new regulatory environment where corporations now need to sort of like evolve, um, mm. I like to think, uh, as an evolution into a new way of um, making business that is, that also considers you know, environmental impact and social impact yeah. and the way they manage their business. So I think it's, I like to see that as an evolution. Most of the time, the challenge, and a lot of people believe, think that, oh, then, you know, this is an environmental problem. Therefore, you're trying, you know, you're trying to kill us as a business. And so there's a lot of sort of like association with anti-business practices. And so every time we're... Wait, what, sorry? What business practices? Let's just say that all of the, all of the environmental problems and the activism around the climate problems and around the environment and are for many years been you know brought to the public by some very form of strong activism okay mm -hmm. and sometimes these forms of activism were carried out with a sense of anti you know anti consumerism anti capitalism mm -hmm. anti and by all means you know I respect that that is someone's point of view that you know there shouldn't be any business or we shouldn't be wearing t-shirts or we shouldn't be eating. We shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't be doing anything. Okay. <laughs> Again, that is, uh, there's 8 billion of us. So, you know, uh, there's 8 billion point of view. So those are um, surely some. So everything that goes into that direction clearly is concerned corporation because it's, it's not in the economic interest of a corporation to say, hey, how about we cut consumptions of these products by 30, 40, 50%, okay? It's, it's just anti-economical, okay? In our experience, there's a, sometimes a perception that some of these innovations are meant to reduce consumption, which by all means, you know, the, um, there are strategies in place to sort of like review consumption models so they are uh, reduced or optimized. That is a long-tier strategy, but I guess the biggest challenge then becomes Okay, explaining corporations that actually what we are suggesting through a series of technology, it's going to create a more efficient business. It's going to create a business that runs better because it makes the best use of their materials, because it makes, um, it's going to create a more transparent relationship with consumers. It's going to allow every customers and consumers to trace their products, their materials. It's going to create, you know, opportunities to, to sell with different business model and different products. So that kind of like perception versus reality is, I would say, is kind of like a challenge. It's it's not in the public knowledge, right? So this is the very beginning. So again, I go back to the internet. Imagine if we go back 30 years ago and someone comes to you and say, hey, we need to make the internet happen. And and it's, you know- What are you talking about? You go, oh, yeah, I have my, you know, my cousin Johnny here is, you know, he works in IT. He's going to make the internet happen. <laughs> and um, I love that you're saying make the internet happen. <laughs> well, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I get it 100%. And there's a couple of points that I want to touch upon. Um, so starting the one uh, talking about activism and uh, the climate anxiety. I think that's such a relevant topic because it seems like a lot of these loud voices, which absolutely are necessary because as you say those are the ones that move the masses raise the awareness masses then move then corporations pay attention and they make a change so ultimately it all leads to a good change but my question is at what cost and how efficient this form of activism and these movements are and could they be actually a bit better and when i say better better for the people so two things so one is Oftentimes, I feel like there's a lot of this, like very passionate speeches and, and these messages, but there is no clear action plan behind them. So it's like somebody's really angrily shouting at somebody else, but but then what, right? So yeah, you're, you're shouting about the problem, but are you giving some sort of solutions? And it's always, and, and uh, by the way, I'm not on anyone's side. I'm just kind of looking at everything from third person's perspective. And kind of the other thing that I was thinking is you touched upon climate anxiety and I've suffered from climate anxiety as I realized, I think we were uh, speaking about that when we first had our call together. And I remember distinctly, I think I was like 16 or 17 and I was back in Latvia 
and I was, uh, you know, watching some YouTube videos and then, you know, this YouTube video came up with the decline in demographics and the climate change. And I remember how petrified and shocked and like scared I was when I was watching it. And it was just, it was just awful. And it, th that fear sat in me for years, if not a decade. So I guess my thought process is, should I be the one to be living with fear for all these years? Like me, a teenager that has a relatively very tiny um, level of impact that I can do versus probably these, these, these few people, the few hundred people in the world that can make real big changes. They don't care about those sort of messages. Um, so we're, I know there's a lot to unpack there. So yeah, that is, uh, thank you. That is, uh, that is a great question. And, um, and I think that is, I think the, the opportunity. So the, thank you. Um, I wish, yes, I wish that for every voice that talks about the the challenge that we're facing, rightly so, there was an equal voice that actually showed a solution. I'm not being, you know, I, I love what we're doing and I'm very passionate about it as an entrepreneur, as an investor, as a change maker. Uh, I'm not being naive, you know, so I, I, I know the challenges we're facing and I know that there are solutions out there. And I know that these solutions do offer do offer alternative ways of running very successful businesses. So whether we are talking about, you know, how do we manage logistics? You know, logistics is one of the biggest uh, threat to environment. There are logistic alternatives. There are, you know, platforms that optimize supply chains. There are electric vehicles. There's new way to move products. There are new ways to optimize that process. There's new way of making. So I could, we could, uh, bring together, uh, you know, I like to think, you know, I like, you know, I like to challenge those who talks about the problems. I like to think that in 2023, when we are modifying DNA, when we're sending people on Mars, I, I well, which year, which year? 2023. Are we not modifying DNA and sending people onto other planets? Yeah. Are we? Yeah. Did we send somebody to Mars? Did I? Well, we are working on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow. I, I, well, I should Sir, start reading news. <laughs> well, Sir Richard Branson just written off a $1 billion investment into you know their operations to force space travel, right? Mm. And I'm sure it's it's not the first, it's not the only, but there are billions that have been investment into space tourism. Now, so if we're capable of doing that, and you know someone's going to be first, right? I like to think that we are capable of solving our own problems here on this planet. And, um, and for every problem that is out there, there are solutions. I, I know that. And, and some of the solutions are already out there. Some of the solutions needs to be brought out there. So yes, so if, if, if for every person that goes out there and make the point about climate challenges, you know, welcome down, please do also show that there are solutions because otherwise you know if you just you know if, if we keep just focusing on the problems we'll just like die in the problems again from anxiety uh, alone yes and uh, i guess we need to we need to convert you know the that kind of like concern about the climate into action into action i am one a full positive replacement right so you know, I believe you can't really go to someone and say, hey, kids, don't eat chocolate, you know. Uh, you, you can say, hey, kids, here's your vegan chocolate equivalent or, you know, have a banana or have something else. And um, yeah, maybe that wasn't the best example. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess there's a whole new sector that is growing of opportunities of change makers. You know, uh, you can call it climate tech. You can call it clean tech, green tech, circular tech. There's lots of tech that is growing. 2022 alone, there's been 3,300 early stage investment. I'm going to say the number wrong. I think it was possibly around $80 billion have, got, have been invested into early stage company, 3,300 of them that are working in these directions. Now, um, we know of some of them, but I really invite the rest of the world to, you know, hey guys, be curious, you know, there are solutions out there. You know, there are, whatever you look at, whether it's, you know, reading a book, buying a pair of jeans, uh, a furniture, a any in any industries, there are great 
there are great alternatives. Yes, there are great alternatives. So there are great brands that are creating alternatives. And um, again, for, in every sectors, you know, in a, from automotive through to uh, I don't know tourism, there are alternative. And for the established players in those sectors, there are solution provider. So again, I'm looking at a phone in front of me. Mm. So you know, are there you know, clearly this is the market that is, you know, been monopolized almost. Well, there's there's kind of. there's two super amazing companies. You know, I think they fight between um you know, I think Apple and Samsung do have fifty two, fifty three percent of market share on mobile phones. And they're constantly, you know, I've been reading reports from both of them. They're kind of like trying to change their materials, the way they design products. Having said that, there are so for such sectors, there are small brands. You know, there's a there's a small company in the Netherlands. By by the way, we don't have any commercial or financial interest mm. with this specific company. I just yeah. like to mention. So uh, it's called Fair F F A I R E, and they do this mobile phone. These mobile phones are disassemblable by everyone, so everyone can kind of like purchase the phone, assemble them, disassemble them. The parts are exchangeable, and so resulting in a more efficient way to create a, a phone and a phone that you could, you know, you don't need to change every so often, you know, you can keep the casing or you can replace the casing and keep the, the hardware. And, um, it's just a more environmental friendly phone that comes to the market with a lower price point by keeping the same marginality. So there are there are players that are creating new, more sustainable products across categories, but also there are new solutions for large corporations. So if you are an Apple, a Samsung, you know, again, new materials, new ways of creating your products, new ways of using your products, new ways of incentivizing consumers to bring back, you know, bring us back your phone, bring us back your headphones, bring, what are you doing with all those cables? bring it back to us. Uh, what are you doing with the cases when they get, bring it back to us? So all of those, they are all new innovations. And um, so, yes, uh, I guess let's all fight for the solutions because... Yeah, I think the one to kind of takeaway um, would be for people not to fall into the step where you despair, but take it one step further, which is okay, fine, we've acknowledged there's a problem, so good job for all the activists and all the, you know, people that advocate for, for all the problems that there are, it's a great job. But then not don't stop there, don't stagnate into that, that step, just take it one step further to, okay, cool, what do we do about it? And then how do we go about doing yeah. that then? And kind of just, just don't get stuck in, in the despair because I, I, I had, uh, and I wasn't conscious of it. But now just looking back at it, I, I realized that I was living with that anxiety at the back of my head for many years and but, came from just one video. But that, but to, to your point, I think we mentioned earlier, um, it is about, there is that kind of like areas where you don't know, you don't know. So I think this is not about, you know, I think we need to exit the kind of like right or wrong blame or not blame. I think there's generally something that is new and it's exciting. And a, a lot of individuals, by all means, regardless of whether these are opinion makers, journalists, investors, corporate leaders, or, you know, Johnny and Jenny walking on the street, they don't know, they don't know. I mean, for us, it's a, it's a fascinating area. It's, it's, it's growing really fast. It needs to grow because corporations have an imperative. They now have, there's now an imperative to drive this change within the next five to seven year horizon. Okay. So this is no longer optionality. This is mandatory. And so all of this, you know, I like to think that we are just about to enter one of the most exciting periods where all of these like new players, new innovations with bold, you know, bold solution for the climate uh, are going to be, are already to like players of the future and of the present. I mean, have you ever seen like a, a brand of shoes going from zero to IPO in six years? These guys call all birds, you know? They you know, like they went from zero to IPO six years. And now I think they're on the, the stock exchange, two hundred million about, you know, constantly traded. So again, so there are, you know, players that are out there. We I like to think that we're gonna see more and more and more and more and more. So um, yeah. So it, 
it, it's happening. Amazing. Um, I want to touch upon uh, just a little point that we mentioned. So you mentioned electric vehicles and also vegan chocolate. <laughs> One thing that rings in my head is sometimes we have all these new innovations and substitutes for old things that we've established maybe are not ideal. So we make a new one, but not always they're better because they create other downsides. So for example, with electric vehicles, of course, you know where I'm going with this. What about the batteries? What about the waste? How do they get recycled? Where does it all go? What about the lithium mining? So is it really better? Was that the best? Was Is electrical vehicle the best solution? Or did we just have to look at alternative fuel for the old engine? It's... Um... It's a fair and very important point. And I think I would say between optimism and, re, you know, between negativity and positivity, there's reality, right? And so the answer is in the data. Okay. So go in Westminster or go into any school and ask 100 kids, what is a sustainable t shirt? I like to bet a penny, you probably get 200 different answers. And by all means, they are all right answers in their own very specific way, okay? Because someone will tell you, uh, you know, a sustainable T-shirt is one that is designed to last forever. Um, a sustainable T-shirt is one that, you know, doesn't use kids' workforce. A sustainable T-shirt can be recycled. A sustainable T-shirt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so for um, EV, and so for energy, and so for, you know, I like to think that for for every single industry that is going to be you know sort of like a an hero and a hunty hero you know whether it is you know wind and solar versus nuclear or whether it is a, a, you know electric vehicles versus normal vehicles is it about do i get a new coconut leather bag or do i buy a vintage you know there's a there are optionalities we could argue i mean we could we could spend the whole day chatting about it and data is really the answers because data are going to be able to say, uh, okay, Nick, okay, Dana, okay, Johnny, uh, so you want to buy this bag? Great. This bag footprint is X, Y, Z. And transparency, traceability of the information from, okay, where was, where was that bag crop produced? How was it produced? How was the soil? Are we able to do that right now? How far are we off? The technology is there. Mm. Yeah, from, from... So is it just not enough players that implement Regenerative this? agriculture through to, you know, sort of uh, biomaterials, the way the soil has been cropped. You know, how, how was that initial product transformed from, you know, point A to point B? Uh, you know, if we're talking about leather transformation, who did transform that material? What did that imply? What was the what was the carbon what was the carbon um, input to make that happen? And so all of this information that's what you know goes onto the traceability platform. So there are platforms that will collect this information throughout the supply and value chain, so that when you know consumers will be in front of a choice, whether the choice is here's you know here's a bag made of recycled plastic, or here's a bag made from you know, uh, pineapple leather. So what's the percentage of, of players, market players that are actually implementing this technology? Tiny. Why is that? For, I guess, many of the reasons that we were mentioning before, I guess one is, first of all, as let's just say, there's been a pivotal moment that we've noticed and that's been Q4 2022, okay? And uh, before, uh, that's when, uh, after COP27, um, leaders of you know European leaders and also American leaders came back, start tightening policy making, and the regulatory environment change. Okay, so now regulations are tighter. So now we've we've shifted from optionality to to mandatory. Okay, so that is the biggest change that's going to drive. Sorry, that is the yeah the biggest change that's going to drive the biggest impact. Okay, so we are now moving from you know optionality to being mandatory. Before that, you know, uh, if a corporation want, wanted to be more or less environmentally friendly, it was the choice of the leadership team. It was the choice of their board. And so, you know, there are corporations that have been m more or less sensitive to such topics, such, um, such uh, conversations, and others have been less so. And 
there wasn't any external drive, you know, apart from your internal morale or the way that, you know, you, if you look, for example, if we look at Northern Europe, Northern Europe has always been very progressive in terms of respecting the environment and the social impact when doing business. So as a result, there are some amazing companies that come from Northern Europe where their, their environmental impact, the social impact, it's paired with their uh, economic and financial output. So as a leader of these organizations and these corporations, if you are the CEO, then, okay, well done, Dana. This year you've done 10 million EBITDA. Great. But you, different from that other company, have also impacted the environment in this way. So actually your carbon footprint is positive. Great. You're going to pay less tax than the other company. So some countries, there's, a, there's a, an alignment between the individual the corporate, the environment. So all of that is aligned. Mm. In other countries, this is just happened now. In some countries, they're still debating, okay? Uh, let's just say continental Europe and UK, it's aligning, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, it will align. Other countries, they will align. But I think, again, what I can share, I guess, my experience is what before was an option and the option was a choice of the entrepreneur or of the board of the corporation, it would now become an imperative. And so why hasn't why are not all companies adopting these solutions? I like to think, you know, hey, they didn't know they didn't know. So they didn't know that they don't know about it. Okay. But most pragmatically, there was no urgency, there was no need. Yeah. Because obviously it takes time and resources and energy to implement a massive change in Yes, and, and of course, without being too much naive or simplistic, you know, for, for, you know, change takes time. So for a large corporation, I can give you some examples without yeah. mentioning them. But we, you know, I remember once we've been working with this family-led fruit and vegetables um, and spice producer. Uh, so you would think, oh my God, look, this is a family-led business, three, four billion in sales. I mean, they've already publicly pledged that they want to be a net zero company by 2025. Or 2030, and and they've already been at like you know kind of like circular economy type of uh, meetings and pledges. So you go, wow! So these guys are going to be, you know, they're going to be putting the, the the food on the accelerator. So we start a conversation with them, and then all of a sudden they realize. You know, I remember we were in a meeting with their boards, and I was like, but guys, what is going to take for us to become fully circular? And we're like, okay, so you have 1,248 type of different packaging, right? And you have 200 suppliers. We need to convince these guys. And, <laughs> and, 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 and that's where they realize, okay, so for our packaging to be, so if we as a corporation want our products to be fully circular, we need to make sure that also when we, when we package our products into a packaging, that packaging can be somehow reused, okay? Let's say you sell strawberries. So you can either sell strawberries in a packaging that can be reused. So, hey, Dana, this is your, this is your day, weekly subscription of strawberries. Use them and then we'll get the packaging back. That's a way, right? Or you could take a, another packaging and then you bring it back to, I don't know, Marks and Spencer, what's close to here. So there are ways to make that happen. However, to make that little change, you know, the, the guy who's supplying the packaging, there needs to be an agreement. And for them to be in agreement, someone needs to say, aha, uh -huh. okay, it's not just one customer, but, you know, like all of my customers now need a solution for recyclable packaging. Therefore, I need to shift from material A to material B. Or I need to provide my customers with a packaging that has a traceability chip inside. Aha, uh -huh. so now I need to adopt that technology. I was in Copenhagen in September or October. And again, great show in the Nordic. And there is a company who's just launched this plastic packaging. You know, when you go to the supermarket and they have like uh, fruit and vegetables into plastic boxes. So imagine the consumer version of that. Okay. Um, and it looks a bit odd at the beginning, but it's, it's a little plastic packaging with a chip that you cannot, you know, kind of like it's embedded. And 
that is a packaging that's been designed, developed, and prototyped to allow food producer to distribute their food into packaging to go through retailers to then go to us so that we can then use them, wash them, and we are individually incentivized to use them and bring them back. To make this happen, however, it takes you know, the food producer to be on board, the packaging producer to be on board, the supply chain, you know, all the supply chain to be on board. Uh, so it takes time. Uh, that's, I guess, my very long answer. <laughs> so what can we as consumers do? Does that make sense? Sorry. I... Yeah, yeah, no, 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 it does. It does, it does definitely. Um, so yeah, so I mean, to the listeners that are listening, what can what can we do? What can the regular person do to help the rise of circular economy? Because you mentioned in the beginning when you were giving the denim example, you also said, you know, Johnny takes and drops off, you know, once you can't use the jeans for anything else, you drop them off. So for example, in my own experience, I, I thought about this the other day. I have a lot of clothes that I donate every year and that's pretty much where they go. But then say some clothes right or are damaged look where do they got it uh thank you i like to think that each individual has the the potential and the opportunity to, to drive change in in any in any you know in any of their capacity you know we all wear 100 ads every day so i guess on your day-to-day -day consumer capacity you know you have a chance to choose you know you, you have a chance to choose product a versus product b and if product b uh, gives you more information and those information are to your liking because they, they respect certain criteria that are important for you, well, you're making a choice, okay? You can also find alternatives. I mean, as in, if you're not happy of product A and product B, you know, there are product C, perhaps smaller products, perhaps that you can, you know, you can start using. Also, there are new brands that are completely, completely challenging the business model. Again, you can look at, you know, all the direct-to-consumer model. They're offering alternative solutions that are both environmentally friendly, they are cheaper, and they are smarter. And so if you don't find the solution you want, look for it because it's very likely being behind the corner. And, um, and, and, and start, I think, we like to believe that it's through consumption that we're going to drive change, okay? Because fighting against consumption uh, is just going to perhaps stop, but it's not going to empower corporations to, to invest in change. So, yes, I think it's, it's by consuming in a way that everyone deems moderate, okay? But products, you know, products that are making bold choices, products that are making bold statement, that is how... I guess um, we start building for you know, different solutions. You you mentioned this, and and I was just uh, I just attended this very incredible uh, summit um, with different change makers, uh, thought leaders, in, in in entrepreneurship, wellness, self development industries, and many more. And so one of the talks there was actually on uh, the fashion industry and uh, and soil and how how fashion industry is the second, I think, biggest polluter in the world. And so kind of the solution that came out there was that technically speaking, we are to reduce our fashion, uh, clothing, buying down to five pieces a year if we were to <laughs> if we were to improve the situation drastically, but that I don't see how that's ever being gonna, going to be realistic. So where is that line between, you know, reality and practicality? And so, so these are, I think, this is where sometimes I've been into many conversations where, you know, the risk is people start fighting because, again, you know, to the, to the question before, you know, like if, if you go into a generic audience and you say, hey, we're going to make the fashion industry more sustainable and then there's going to be a fight because someone would say, Therefore, you're not gonna buy a dress. You know, you need to reduce the amount. You you go. You need to go around naked, or you shouldn't buy this. You should by all means. Are these solutions? Of course. You know, like we go back to historic times. We all go around naked. We we barter products, and that is a solution. Well, in the eyes of some, it is okay. Realistically, it's a process of evolution. So I think again, by all means, if eight billion people decide not to buy products. 
that's yeah, but that's <laughs> what I'm saying. That's never going to happen. So I don't know. But, we, you know, we don't know. But if that was to happen, then that is what's going to happen. Having said that, then people still need to eat, right? Still yeah. need to move. So um, I guess I I like to believe uh, that there are, um, you know. Question: Have we gone through a period of hyperconsumption, driven by you know high volumes of products at low price? Yes, you know fast. It's called fast fashion for a reason. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is that perhaps going to change? Maybe, maybe yes, maybe not. You know, are some corporations going to review their strategy and perhaps going back? You know, like when I was a kid, you know, I remember you know when I got my first bar war. It was like an event, and I think it's still there. It has been there thirty years. Or, you know, if if my when my grandfather got his first car, you know, you would keep a car for twenty years. So, uh, if we go back to making products that you know last for longer, surely you know, th- and that is a strategy. Some corporations are. Using. But isn't that in direct clash with the ever increasing annual revenue model? Where you need to keep. That's where new business models come in place. Okay, um, absolutely. So to your question, you know, how do we remain competitive with increased, com- you know, compet- How do you remain competitive with increased competitions and var- you know variety and volumes of low? Um, yes. How do you how product? do you marry keep growing sales? Yeah. At this whilst at the same time making things that will last a client much longer so they are not in necessity of buying new things because you've made such great things. Yes. So those are the models where large corporations are, in fact, testing. I mean, one of the largest uh, clothing and apparel groups, you know, it's also one of the most innovative. So um, if we, you know, let's take H&M. Okay, H&M, they have 4,300 something stores between all of their brands. Clearly, they are the one responsible for a very large portion. But what perhaps fewer people know is that they've also been implementing track and trace systems for many years, uh, at least five years. Uh, I think Carcade just released through Bayou their latest report. So they're tracking and trace all of their uh, impact. And they are, they've been investing to their foundations and to their labs through a variety of innovations. Literally, there's a, there's a company that's making products out of thin air. And by that, I mean they're literally filtering the carbon dioxide in the air, extract fibers, and creating products. So there are some amazing innovations out there. Some of these corporations, again, they're making, you know, they're exploring these opportunities. They're looking into adopting these opportunities. It is, of course, it is challenging to remain competitive and remain sustainable. But I wouldn't say it's only a matter of high quality, long lasting products versus low quality, um, you know, kind of like short periods, fast fashion products. That is definitely a theme. There are other concerns, you know, in regards to manufacturing, in regards to logistic, in regards to do we need to create, you know, for example, if we look at consumer goods, do we need, you know, I'm looking around here to get some products, but, you know, think about the furniture or think about, um, you know, products made out of plastic do we need to create 10 million units to achieve economy of scale when we have demand for 7 million units and the other 3 millions we're just gonna shift them right Hmm. or or how about we start looking at smarter way to actually start producing on demand start factoring ai into manufacturing you know think about toys plastic toys where are plastic toys produced Ha. Right? So toys is typical example of a sector that is largely driven by producing big amounts of uh, big amounts of low um, sl- low price items with low engagement. As a result, kids, you know, I don't have kids myself, but I've seen my nephew, my niece, and my friend's kid, they have like twenty thousand toys each, right? And these are very likely to be produced overseas, shipped over to here, and then once they are no longer, you know, I don't know, interesting or relevant, what happens, right? So the industries that are playing, the the brands and the corporations that are playing into that games, clearly they need to produce thousands and thousands and thousands of, you know, they need to produce toys at volume, low margin, with all those operational costs to actually be having a competitive product. Now imagine all of a sudden someone comes to you and say, hi, 
Do you want a toy? Good. Why don't you go to Tesco and you print one? And <laughs> and and all of the sudden, your you know all of your manufacturing, your your goods, your logistic costs, with the impact they create in you know sourcing products, creating goods, shipping goods, all of that can go away. And you just go, and you say, you know what? I feel like playing with you know, princes and the bears or, you know, the, these are the story. And you just go to your supermarkets or to your stationery and you just print them. And then... Is it that easy? Is it that scale? Well, this is happening. Effective? This is happening today. So there's an amazing company called, I think they're called Lasso Loop. And they are, they have been testing in California. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great, um, it's a great um, product engineer from Australia. Uh, extremely passionate. He's been working on this machine for, I don't know, I got knows, 26 years. But they're now testing in communities in California. These machines, these yeah. machines allow a residential recycling of, of plastic so that it can be transformed into flakes. You connect that to 3D printing. 3D printing now is, has become, uh, it's ready to reach residential use. Okay, so machines are, you know, less than $800. Uh, the software is available. Um, the the shape of the products are there are platforms out there where you can download shapes of products for pennies, uh, one dollars, two dollars. So all of these elements are out there. And then if you go to, you know, you go to Germany, kids at school print their toys. And so all of these exist now. I like to think that in the next few years, as we have established toys maker, we will also have newcomers and, and they will no longer sell toys. They will just sell stories. And then for every stories, you will have a toy that you can print. Once you finish playing with a toy, you recycle that toy into another toy. I was going to say in all this equation, there definitely should be some sort of incentive for the people that want to go and just print a toy to just give up a toy or like get rid of a toy or some sort of plot. Well, the, the, if the incentive is you, the incentive is you, you know, you are, you are choosing to, to purchase an experience that is more engaging because you choose to print a new toy. Um, you are very likely to pay a products the same price, if not less than the other products, because you don't have all the, you know, all the logistic expenses that related, you don't have the packaging. So there's a lot of unrequired um, elements that you don't have to pay for. By the way, as you're doing that action, you're also transforming your, your, your plastic bottles into a toy. So there's, so the engagement is there. And so do you want to look at it from an environmental point of view? Great. You're turning a plastic bottles into a toy. Second, you want to look at it from an engagement point of view, you are designing your own toy. So do you want to print, I don't know, like a princess, but you want them to be with mustaches because, you know, like that's your ideas of good, do that. And go and do that with your, you know, with your friends and family, your mom in the closest store. And then once you've done that, you bring it back, you print another one. So you have an environmental incentive, you have an engagement incentive. And you have an economic incentive. Mm -hmm. The solutions are out there. I mean, okay. That, so when are we rolling this out everywhere? Sounds great. Um, this is happening. I mean, there. You know, schools in Germany are testing uh, printing of toys. Communities in California are testing recycling of plastics. There are a variety, variety of brands. I mean, you know, some are companies we've invested in, but others are you know company we'd love to invest or play with. And they are creating, you know, furniture as a service, products as a service. They're printing it. It's fascinating. This is a little bit of self-promotion, uh, but, you know, there's a company that we love and they have transformed 2,400 kilos of fishing nets taken from the sea into flower pots for Milan Fashion District. Now, I had no idea how much... 2,400 kilos of fishing nets. Every kilos of fishing net, it's about a kilometers. Okay. So, <laughs> wow. so if you imagine 2,500 kilos of fishing net, it's about 2,500 kilometers of fishing nets. Wow. Okay. Incredible. So, this is like a third of, you know, a third of the Italy cost. Sorry, I'm Italian, so I know those numbers. <laughs> so, what I'm, what I'm saying here is the opportunities are out there. The solutions are out there. 
um, the solutions, in our view, they always need to offer, as we said before, an economic incentive, an engagement incentive, and an environmental incentive. The environmental incentive, it's a required condition, but it's not enough. You know, here's a new toy. Well, the toy needs to be fun. The toy needs to be cool. The toy needs to be as cool as another toy. Okay. As cheap and also creates the environment. Well, I, I really hope that uh, more people like you are going to be driving this <laughs> this movement forward because it sounds amazing from, from, you know, 360 degrees. I want to talk more about your journey. So your first venture into the world of sustainability and circular economy started when you were 10. Talk to me about that. Okay. Yeah. I guess my very first encounter was when I was walking on this beach and I found these kids playing with this, uh, you know, they were making cars out of Pepsi cans. And, and I grabbed one instinctively. I didn't, you know, it's not that I had my ikigai purpose written all over. So it's taken me a few years. But yes, when I was when I was 10 years old, all my friends had these most amazing skateboards from the United States. It was the 80s, by, by the way. You know, my mom, my dad were concerned that, you know, if you go around skateboarding, then people would give you, you know, drugs and, and it was dangerous. And, and um, I tried to persuade them that that's never the case. But uh, regardless, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't want me to purchase a skateboard. So my friends were throwing away skateboards as the graphic was wearing out. So I used to take these skateboards, removing the first layer of ply, put in some stickers, put some color, put some varnish, go back to school and sell it back to other kids. And that's how I get my, my first skateboard. So that was, yeah, we could call it the very first venture in, in the space of recycling. I love that. I love that. And I know where the inspiration came from, because uh, when we had our call, you had this very uh, beautiful thing that you showed me. Do you want to share that with the audience as well? The, 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 the yeah. No, yeah, no, I guess the, um, on my desk, I have this car made out of, um, you know. Perfectly cars. nice looking uh, it, car model. It's, it's a little... It's a little Volkswagen Beetle made out of uh, soft drinks cans. The reason why this is so inspiring, and again, it's taken me a few years to sort of like rationalize that, but it's, yeah, if, 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 if someone can see, you know, if, if someone can see a car out of a bunch of waste, you know, clearly... Which were kids in Mauritius, basically. Yeah, the kids in Mauritius, <laughs> but also every, 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 say every kids today that is going into the sector, you know, everyone that can see an opportunity... In, in transforming waste, unused materials, um, or transform inefficiency is something. So clearly, they must be the most imaginative persons on the planet. And I think, you know, imagination is, imagination is what we need to drive change, right? So imagination is a driver for good, and I love that. It's always inspired me. And then once you, you know, once a person see a car out of a bunch of, you know, Pepsi cans or waste, you know, uh, behind that magic of transformation, you're also transforming a cost to society into a product with a potential for profit. And, and that's the magic of being an entrepreneur. So I think if you combine these two acts of magic, you're making sure that that, you know, soft drink cans doesn't go into the landfill, doesn't go into the ocean. And uh, so this is, this is what has inspired me at the beginning and now all the other amazing people that are with me on this journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I like to think that hopefully this could inspire others, you know, kind of like to transform many of the problems we have in fantastic opportunity. Yeah. Mm. So Nick, if I asked you what your purpose is, what would you tell me? Um, it's, um, I was, you know, I, I see you have a, a Ikigai book there. Um, I've learned to phrase this as um, it, it, it's something like, you know, to venture and adventure, uh, which means to explore. This is really why I exist on this planet is like to explore, venture and adventure, learn, learn more, apprehend. And that is experience. It's mistakes. It's to make the world a better place. So that's kind of like, I guess, uh, my, my ikigai. It's taken me a lot of years. To sort of like, uh, I was going to ask, how long did it take you to define that for yourself? It's taken me a lot of experiences. It's taken me. It's it's taken me mirroring with others. I really need to say thank you to a person who's you, you know have been on a journey of seven years of self discovery. So it's not something that you wake up and you hey 
he's my key guy. I would say, I believe it's, I think it's very important for every entrepreneur that they kind of like question themselves on, you know, what's their purpose. And I'm not talking about kind of like an abstract spiritual purpose. I'm talking about, you know, what are you doing here? You know, like, <laughs> what are you doing on this planet? Because once you, once you find that and kind of like you, you click with that. Personally, I've kind of like experienced this like, huge burst of energy and uh and that's what's driving me that's what's driving other people so i always 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 um invite everyone virtually whether you know these are entrepreneurs or you know any individuals to really find their own purpose unrelated but related you know i like to think you know like in this in nature you know nature is perfect because everything that exists in nature has their own purpose so you know if you look at you know a perfect natural environment everything exists with a purpose and there's equilibrium and so i like to believe that also in humanity you know like there's eight billion of us but if we all lived doing what each of us loved mm. you know perhaps there's no opportunity there most definitely how did your career evolve over that and how did you end up working in this field in the end because from 10 years old to how old are you now? 11. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, um, yeah, so I was born in 1976. So I'm, I, I actually was 47 uh, Tuesday. But happy belated. <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I, I had no idea I was going to do this. I had no idea. And uh, frankly, even if I had an idea, I, I wouldn't have known. Okay, so what experience should I make or what should I study? There isn't like a, you know, a course for, oh yeah, here's a, let's do a little bit of like, you know, entrepreneurship and venture capital and, and corporate that doesn't really exist. So we sort of like, I said we, because it's, you know, my partners and I, we created this uh, to make. Were they your childhood friends? Hmm? They're your old, old time friends? These are, I say, you know, these are sort of like people that have come together on a journey. You know, like if we say, if I say my purpose is venture and adventure, is to explore throughout these ventures and adventures, I've met some extraordinary people that I'm lucky enough to call business partners today. And these are people that, you know, again, have gone through similar, same adventures. And then we've decided to kind of like join forces. Um, I started into the creative industries uh, when I was in my 20s. I love the United States. I love, you know, I, I, you know, I love marketing as a mix of business and creativity. I was in love. I was reading all sort of books. Um, I went to San Francisco at Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley in the late nineties was, you know, the I don't know the mecca of creativity. Lately, then I I did a master in um, what is now Silicon Valley. At the time, was uh, Irvine less sexy. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, there was this, I remember I did my master essay on um, a cloud-based set of business templates. Okay. I did call it Toolkit 69. It was a bit weird. Uh, it sounded a bit like, you know, kind of like a, but so technology was there. And, but even then I started my career into the, the, the you know, the glamorous world of advertising. So I'd start working for this amazing company called Chaya Day, which at the time had just taken back Apple computers. And so, you know, I was a kid, 23 years old in Los Angeles, working for Apple. You know, I was... Living the life. Yeah, no, it was just like, uh, yeah, all over, you know, I was on, I was on the moon. I was super happy. And I continued working in that creative industries. You know, I've worked, I've worked in J. Walter Thompson. I was driving innovations there. I work in a part of Boga Hegarty in London. I met some extraordinary people. And then um, I went to another network. It's just on the site, I had this drive of creating ventures. So I also set up with some friends in 2007. We set up a most amazing content uh, agency, which then became uh, some different content magazines. And these are some of my best friends. They're still going today. You know, it's one of the, uh, it's called Fast and Sea Built. And it's one of the now established, um, you know, kind of like events, communication agency for the fashion industry in Italy. They're doing great. I love them. Right. And however, there was something that was kind of like bubbling in me that I didn't quite uh, know. And um, so in 2006, I remember 
as I was leaving from as I was leaving from Milan to come to London, we created this kind of like recycling company. So it was kind of like the the grown up version of the skateboard, and um, we would recycle. Uh, you know, advertising billboards made out of plastic. Mm, I think so. Yeah. So we would recycle those and make accessories, and then we would sell these accessories to corporation as promotional item mm -hmm. gadgets. Right. So these companies start growing, and I thought, oh, and that really, uh, you know, the creative industry. I loved it, and uh, but this, it was. I don't know. It just it was giving me energy. It just it was something very exciting. Personally, didn't really know how to grow a business in that area. You know, uh, maybe it was a bit too early. But I was definitely too early. Maybe I didn't know how to to grow a business. You know, how do you invest in a business? How do you how do you invest money? How do you receive money? How do you how do you grow? You know, a business internationally. And but that is what's given me the motivation to then set up Spin Ventures and and to come. You know be where we are today mm. so the upcycling business that you mentioned is that the one that we're talking about yes yes mm. yeah okay so what have you learned from that business from doing that business because well, it didn't because it you, ultimately you did you close the company or yeah yeah yeah. so that um i guess on the positive side i guess the the excitement uh the, the excitement of the business was great but from a from a personal experience yeah, that w that went belly up, and there's been other sort of like ventures that have. So it was the gone. business side that kind of was missing the, the the knowledge of how to make it sustainable the, economically, or it was I would say in 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 that and in other businesses there's been you know I guess problems in growing the businesses and again how do you drive growth how do you do drive sales how do you receive investments. How do you make sure you don't, you know, you don't, you don't end up fighting with your co-founders, founders, business Fun partners, uh, investors? Uh, how do you, how do you create a board? How do you manage a board? How do you? So all of those, these are experience. You know, they're not. You don't learn at school. You, you know, unless unless you study law, mm -hmm. you don't learn. So there's some experiences that uh, I guess personally I've done going through them and yes you know it's 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 not always been plain sailing you know in fact there's been some uh, you know some some failures from learning learning to you know how do you choose the right business partners how do you choose the right deals you know how do you choose to say no again little by little again you i've learned a lot what would you what do you wish you most that you knew back then of all these things that you mentioned i wish i'd listened to my gut mm -hmm. that's the um the abstract answer, I guess. I think it's virtually impossible. Like if you look at the experience that you go through in the growth of a venture from, you know, your, you know, your ideas into a garage from, you know, how do you turn that into a products and more products and how do you grow that into successful business and, and, and failing business? How do you engage with 52 shareholders? How do you do a, you know, how do you buy out some share, some investors? How do you take over a business? How do you sell a business? All of this, it's, you can, yeah, you may study, you may read books, but lately, if, you know, once you go through this experience, that's when you learn. I don't know, you know, and I wish, you know, if I had to go back and do what I've done, I would do it again. Yes. Only shared, learn, shared experience I can only experience I can share, I guess, is, you know, we all got that little voice <laughs> inside us. Yes. Yeah. Listen to that voice because our our instinct knows better. I couldn't agree more. And I, I keep saying this, but year after year, when I write my New Year's recap yeah. and the lessons that I've learned, my main takeaways, I remember this year after year, it was trust your gut with examples when I didn't and it went wrong and, you know. It's just you have to, you have to. Yeah. It's, it's the innate intelligence that we have built in. So you also mentioned that you worked for some of the best advertising content and media agencies out there. So in terms of marketing, what were kind of your main takeaways that you that you learned there that could benefit anyone listening that is maybe running a business, starting a business? I'm extremely happy and lucky that I've gone through these uh, experiences, um, I think. Marketing of a business, especially of a startup, it's not like a something on the side you know like when you are an entrepreneur you know you are constantly selling you know you are 
you know, you're selling yourself, you're selling yourself to the team, you're selling a plan to the team, you're selling to the investors, you're selling your products, you're selling products to wholesaler, retailers, buyers, investors. So I think the ability to engage with people, the ability to create a brand, the, it's the ability to choose. There's this phrase from Steve Jobs, and I had the very, you know, luck to actually meet the guy. You know, I was holding a layout, so don't. <laughs> mm. But still, and but there are plenty of videos, and he says, guys, marketing is about values. The ability to create connections with others, I think it's a very, it's a very basic of every business. Mm practice person. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, Spend Ventures. Yeah. So you've mentioned that the platform itself includes the venture builder, the venture accelerator, the venture capital firm, the consulting firm, and you're also working on the foundation. Is that something? Correct. No, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 we're planning. I guess we are, we are building and we're planning this ecosystem designed in that way to to really make sure that we can accelerate the transition to circularity and uh yes yeah, so these are all the all the moving parts so you yourselves are making sure that you are 100 percent taking care of making these circular projects happen from a to z with all your arms there's so there's this is this is a whole ecosystem so there's a lot of people uh, to make these things happen. I guess, uh, first and foremost, the people who have joined me in this path, uh, these, you know, again, I call them partners today. They share the same ambition. We are surrounded ourselves by a group of like um, experts in their own respective fields. And, and then I guess the next challenge is to find, you know, like individuals that are going to be as passionate as us, but they're going to take on individual. So for example, the foundation, who's going to be leading that effort. So again, it needs to be someone who clearly had previous experience in, in growing a foundation, but then that they would be happy to create a foundation around you know, new biomaterials, new business models. The reason why we're setting up a foundation is some of these innovations are extremely high risk. Some of the materials may or may not be used, for example, but also some of the, the business models that you know, these innovators are designing are extremely complex. Like, think about furniture as a service. You know, it's, it, it just changed the old econometric and financial models on how you run a business. And so for business remaining competitive, but also running alternative business models, that's, that's whether either a foundation or a university can deliver value. So in order to run that, we need someone that says, hey, guys, I run a foundation. I'm passionate about this. I want to make this happen. So that's how we're growing, you know, by, by bringing in people that share the same passion, but with specific set of expertise. And So what does the future hold for us? I love to. Well, rather, where do you want to take spin? Well, if I, you know, we always ask, what if we had a magic wand? I think we're just about, we're just at the beginning. We are, I think everything we've done until yesterday is getting ready for today. I think we're at the beginning. We say, you know, accelerate transition to circularity, but in fact, it's to spin. You know, when you spin something, you know, you 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 give it a circular motion. So, so we say, you know, we want to spin the world. You know, it's kind of like, ideally, our is an open-handed vision. You know, we want all the worlds to be circular. So, you know, it's not that I, it's not that we're gonna be happy. Oh, we've done, you know, we've achieved this. No, we want to spin the world. You know, we want to make sure that every corporation out there operates in a, on a circular model because it's, it's just more efficient, it's smarter, and it creates new opportunities for more efficient business models for the environment. And lately, it can be more fun. I love that. If I asked you to share with me three of your precious life lessons what would you share three precious life lessons first i think it, it, it's really one it goes back to you know listen to that inner voice you know kind of like listen to that inner voice find it you know once you find it live it enjoy it in french i would say you know don't care about anything else mm. and there's a there's a phrase i'm going to use a phrase uh which i think it's um it's powerful and uh i carry it on my phone and it says, you know, a wise man once said, have you ever wondered why uh, bees don't waste their time explaining flies and that shit mm. tastes better than honey? 
And I think it actually works almost better the other way around. You know, if, if we say, have you ever wondered why flies don't waste their time explaining bees, then that shit is better than honey. And uh, I like to share this as a big, big learning so far in my life because once, you know, because in nature, bees don't, you know, bees are not jealous of fly and fly are not jealous by bees. You know, it's not that a fly wake up and it's like, oh my God, you know, I'm still flying around the shit today, but look at, look at the beautiful bees going around the, you know, the flowers and the honey. In nature, you know, they just, they just do what they are, you know. We human, you know, we've got this amazing brain of ours and, but sometimes we, we, we don't know whether we are fly or bees. And I'm not talking about it in the, I'm a lion or I'm a giraffe. I'm just saying, you know, what are we? Why, what do we do on this planet? I think once you find that, whether you are a fly, a bee, a hippo, a giraffe, a lion, a tiger, I mean, not in the tiger gazelle sense, right? I'm just saying, whoever you are, and there's 8 billion of us, just, you know, listen to that, follow that, enjoy that. And, you know, who cares about the bees or the flies? Hello, friends. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe and share it with someone. I would love to hear your feedback and suggestions as to what guests you would like to see on the show next. See you next week.